Hi, I'm Ted Steinberg, and I want to talk to you today about the ecological history of Greater New York, the place where I was born and raised. The first thing that you need to understand about New York is that it exists in the estuary of the Hudson River. Estuaries are special places where fresh and salt water come together. They're loaded with nutrients, and they're thus teeming with plant and animal life. Back in Hudson's day, when he came sailing into New York Harbor in 1609, he encountered an ecological cornucopia. Everything from blueberry bog to cedar swamp. There were fish like shad and sturgeon. There were ducks, geese, herons, and raptors, wild berries, and grasses galore. Back then, the Flushing Meadows in Queens really was a meadow and not a tennis center. Waters played a central role in New York's ecological history. The seminal moment came in the early 19th century when New York's leaders decided for the first time that instead of relying on brooks and springs on Manhattan Island, that they'd go further afield for water, initially 30, 40 miles to the north, to the Croton watershed. And then on they went to conquer the waters of the Catskill Mountains and the Delaware. Billions of gallons of water came coursing into New York. And at one point, New Yorkers were using, on average, for each person, 200 gallons of water per day. All this water coursing into New York did two things. First of all, it helped to underwrite the explosive population growth of New York City. And second, it completely transformed the ecology of New York Harbor, because all this water had to go somewhere as wastewater. And as it did, it caused the oxygen level in the water surrounding New York to plunge to the point where it took a terrible toll on marine life. There's a reason the Gowanus Canal looks like it does and why you would want to go for a swim in it. One way to think about New York is to visualize it as a giant reclamation project. If you consider New York Harbor as a whole, in the period between the early 19th century and 1980, an area of marshland and open water equivalent to seven times the size of the entire island of Manhattan was converted into solid ground to make way for urban development, roads, parks, and landfills. Density is one of the great continuities in New York's ecological history. Back in Henry Hudson's time, there was enormous natural density. There were oyster beds, miles and miles of them, and mussels and clams and crabs. Fast forward several hundred years, and this natural density had given way to a kind of unnatural kind. Now, there are 19 million people living in the greater New York area. That's 6% of the entire U.S. population. And the kinds of plants and animals that flourish here are the ones that coexist well in an area jam-packed with human beings. Manhattan now has 69,464 people per square mile, and that begs the question of limits. When is dense too dense? For a long while now, the answer to that has been, not yet. All these people crammed into New York have created a form of high-density urbanism, but they've also produced a kind of high-risk landscape, as was underscored during Hurricane Sandy. The storm brought the sea surging back into lower Manhattan. Cars floated down Wall Street. The Battery Tunnel filled to the hilt with water. Coney Island reverted to its earlier life as an island. At Jones Beach, Donald Trump's massive development project, Trump on the ocean, became Trump in the ocean. When it was all over, those in positions of authority said things like, the city can't control Mother Nature. But the reality is 
is that New Yorkers have been thumbing their nose at the sea for some 200 years. And in this sense, the calamity was a self-inflicted one. There's likely to be more high water ahead as sea level continues to rise throughout the 21st century, which makes it important for those of us who love New York to think about how we're going to go about preserving it.